Thank you very much, Vikas, for introducing us. Well, first of all, on the behalf of Academy of Art University, we would love to thank organizers for inviting us to participate in this discussion. We are thrilled, me and, and Gina, to take part in it, and thank you again. So we, first of all, we would love to know a little bit more about our audience. If you don't mind, probably just raise your hand, those who, of you who do work in fashion industry already, so that we understand a little bit. All right, more than, more than we imagine. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice to meet your colleagues. Um, and those of you who are on more like scientific or academic side, all right. And technology and startups. Okay, so it's, I would say like 25, 25 and 50%. We are really, really glad to meet all of you. So uh, all of the above, exactly, exactly. So um, let us start. Well, as, as long as we have a very uh, various audience here, we would love to be uh, clear and ensure that we use the same terms, right? So what is fashion, finally? Uh, well, first of all, fashion is a popular style of practice. It's actually a behavior before any other thing. It's a trend and style in which a person dresses or behaves. And then just the third, it's new creations by clothing designers. So when you think about fashion, first of all, it's how people dress. What do they choose? Eventually, what do they buy? And um, what are their habits and manners? Uh, what is design? Well, design is the um, creation of a plan for uh, a construction of an object or a system. So it's the, the plan of that of that object, but it's also the physical appearance of, of the object itself. When it's applied to fashion, uh, we call design the aesthetics and function in the final form of that object. How do we judge if um, a certain object is designed in a, in a good or bad way? Well, probably the very simple rule might be proportions. Golden rule is a very simple way to describe harmonious proportions. And in terms of um, design and function, there should be a harmony between the uh, physical appearance of the object and its function. Like for instance, that, that chair and the plan of a coat uh, underneath, they are both relative to the field of design. Another important notion that we would like to define is luxury. So what is luxury actually? It is uh, something inessential but conducive to pleasure and comfort, expensive or hard to obtain. These are assumptions, living or surroundings and status symbols. It's very important to understand that um, uh, luxury has a very uh, hard cultural, social, and time period differences. Like something considered luxury in one period of history would not be considered luxurious 100 years later, let's say. Um, and also, um, it's a different notion of luxury for people of different generations and of different geographic appurtenance. What is beautiful? in fashion. You cannot call something beautiful just because you find it beautiful. It's very subjective. Like both of these women are beautiful for their cultures and time in history where, where they lived. Uh, that will probably explain us that, that fashion is a, a field between industry and art because a lot of notions in fashion are very subjective. What is a fashion effect, so-called fashion effect? Why is something, an object, <laughs> or um, a service, why something become popular? Well, there are um, so-called opinion leaders or style icons. Uh, these are people who have high cultural status. When they start to wear new or different clothes, that's when a fashion trend might start, because others try to copy them. So it's not because you wear a black turtleneck sweater that you become Steve Jobs, but still, for probably a lot of young startups, that's one of the you know style reference. Let's say. Uh, what are the main components of fashion? Well, those of you who work with fashion data, they, of course you know that these are color, form, and material, the fabric. Well, at least for the color, we can have a little bit of reference and taxonomy. There is a company who worldwide tries to classify the colors, Pantone. I'm pretty sure that everyone who works with trying to define how you can compare one color to another. Uh, all of you had contact with that, with that company. So every year Pantone um, publishes uh, forecasts and, and trends on uh, colors that would be popular in any consumer goods 
in the next year. And every year they define a color of the year. So this year it's Marsala, color of kind of red wine. And you can see how the color choices were, uh, were changing through the years. How they do that? They analyze multiple factors. I think it's more, it's quantifying and, 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 and qualifying uh, kind of discussion and, and analyze of a very uh, large amount of data. But still, they manage to, uh, to combine it and uh, decide for every year what color will be most popular. And um, I think it's a, a kind of prognosis that, uh, a, a kind of self-fulfilling prognosis, because when they announce that color, that's when actually a lot of goods and a lot of uh, manufacturers definitely start using it, and eventually it becomes the color of, of a certain period of time. Um, another important notion for, for fashion, another main component is form. So forms are very various and it's really difficult to find a common taxonomy, common classification in describing those forms. Mostly because of the really large um, variety. Um, another main component is fabric. And that's when, where I feel uh, the mm, big data and big fashion data can be helpful for designers because uh, I think for future designers it will be very helpful to be able to have um, only services who would help them to source for fabrics and the services who would help them to find fabrics according to their request. Um, let's um, speak about designers. Who, who are fashion designers? Um, their training usually includes fashion illustration, pattern making, product development, clothing production. Um, another very important notion for, um, for fashion is um, fashion trend. So how does a fashion trend start? Who defined them? There are numerous uh, forecasting agencies. Uh, it's a quite recent activity, I would say. So if we think that uh, modern fashion started, let's say, like 100 years ago, the trend forecasting agencies, first of them appeared probably around 30, 30 years ago. They analyzed numerous parameters from politics and demographics to art, culture, and movies. And uh, they usually uh, make forecasting prognosis for the next two years, approximately. And the agencies relay the data to fabric manufacturers and designs, designers, and designers work with that fabrics and take trend forecasts into consideration when creating their collection. And so that's how in a lot of um, uh, fashion garments, mostly the companies who do take the fashion trends in consideration, um, uh, they are, um, when they finally produce the collections, we can see that the fashion trends are, are present. Well, fashion industry today is a very highly global um, field of economics. Very often the garments are designed in one country, produced in another one, and, and, sell, and sold worldwide. Uh, fashion actually is a, a product of industrial revolution of late 1800s. In the last century it was uh, functioning in a quite established uh, way when designers were creating the garments based on their inspiration and for a certain type of consumer, the collection were shown six months before the product hit the store and uh, when they were showing it them on, on fashion weeks, it was done in order to seduce the press and wholesale buyers and to create the buzz around those collections and um, by the time when the products were delivered to the stores, usually it was six months from the moment of the first presentation, uh, the press had the time to create interest within the consumer for the kind of garments and they were, uh, you know, they could meet the interest of consumers in the stores. At the end of 90s, excuse me, the end of 90s when fast fashion companies appeared, that's when the, the notion of fashion trends started really to play a very important role because fast, fast fashion companies usually do not, um, well, they, they basically uh, they get inspired with what the creative designers do and they relay uh, their work on, um, on fashion trends and um, uh, they, uh, they produce the collections that somehow based on the inspiration of, of creative designers. So um, I would very roughly uh, divide the uh, contemporary fashion brands in two large categories. Well, first of them are creative artists, very edgy designers, who uh, 
base their collection creation on their proper inspiration. Uh, usually, uh, these kind of designers, they're not limited in use of luxury materials and they, uh, they normally do need fashion shows to show the collections to the press, to impress um, the, uh, the press and to sell it to wholesale buyers. And uh, those kind of designers are very often copied by marketing-driven companies. This very creative uh, crowd is represent representing um, less than 5% of the um, of the fashion market, so it's a very upper part of the iceberg. The marketing-driven brands, and Zara is a perfect example for that, they uh, analyze fashion trends before they um, create the collection, and for them, the fashion trends have a prerogative over the artistic inspiration of the designer. Uh, normally, the use of materials for them is defined by the best-selling price of the garment, and they do not need to spend on fashion shows because their product is easy to understand and it sells itself very easily. Uh, the uh, marketing-driven brands, some of them are just shamelessly copying. The uh, creative designers, they even don't need to do advertising because those creative luxury brands do that for them. So as fashion design insiders, I would say we, we admire the firsts and we understand the strategy of seconds because first create and second calculate. And first we'll probably vanish with time, but we will remember them, we will quote them, we will dedicate them collections, we will struggle to buy their vintage pieces, uh, and they, in a certain way, make us dream. And they are, I would say, in essence of fashion as an art. The second, they will survive financially, they will provide jobs, and they will support families. It works very well for living, but um, marketing-driven brands, they need the creative liberty of artists in order to keep this artistic industry exciting and vibrating. So, I mean, Working with fashion data, we have to understand both, and we have to uh, realize that the uh, you know the artistic side of fashion comes from a very very small quantity of brands. They probably represent a tiny portion of the market, but that's what makes the consumer dream. So when discussing fashion data, we are on the territory of marketing-driven brands, but we have to keep in mind that they need um, those artistic minds, and their consumers are really inspired by those creative designer brands. So. Slide. Uh, big topics in big data in fashion. And the main problems, you know them, of course, better, better than me. Well, f five, let's say, five uh, main problems are forecasting fashion trends, influencer analytics, visual search, natural language processing, and style recommendation algorithms. Um, uh, I would say that the, the, the best way where those five problems are described is a fashioning data report created by Lisa Kindred and Julia Steele in 2015. Probably many of you have read it. If not, I highly recommend to read this report because that's where a lot of uh, startups working with big fashion data and a lot of challenges and problems in this field are very well described. So uh, I will very briefly go through those five fails, and then I will pass the microphone to Gina, who will go deeply into, into those challenges. Fashion trends forecasting. So there are many uh, new startups who started to work with fashion trends forecasting. It's edited, trend analytics, WGSN. We in, um, in Academy of Art University, we usually do teach our students to understand how trends are settled, and we teach them how to create their own methodology, not using someone else's. So, um, of course, all those, all those tools are very helpful to uh, fast fashion companies, to bigger production companies. Uh, to our students, we really try to, to teach them how they can, they can create their own fashion trend forecasts. Another big field is influencer analytics. I'm sure that in this audience, we probably have people who work in this kind of startups. Um, main companies dealing with influencers analytics are Curalate, Tribe Dynamics, DeMarie, Forecard. Uh, these are platforms for fashion and lifestyle brands to track and analyze complex influencer programs. Uh, so what do they do is the ranking of influencers uh, by field of uh, social media, um, Another very important problem in um, uh, fashion data 
in big fashion data is visual search. Again, you all perfectly know that it's difficult to, to describe uh, an image and uh, very many of those garments can be described in a, in a very various way. So sometimes having, uh, being able to search with just an image would be very helpful. I think here the question is still open. I think a lot of startups are, are struggling to, to make it real. And it's one of the very big challenges. Natural language processing is another major problem of um, big data in fashion. Uh, one of the companies I really found very interesting is Genostyle. Uh, they try to develop um, a DNA of a fashion garment. Probably some of you know, the, many of you of course know the radio Pandora and the Genome Music Project which is behind Pandora when you can describe any piece of music in 400 categories and the data for these categories. So Genostyle is doing the same for, for fashion when they, can, when they are trying to describe a style of a certain person in a number of categories and they try to build this taxonomy and a common language for various fashion companies. Well, the problem in fashion, and Gene, I think, will go more deeply into that subject, is that uh, the, there is no really common taxonomy in, in fashion because those companies have really have difficulties to collaborate. Like very often, I mean, everyone tries to be different. Consumers try to be different, fashion companies as well. And very often they do have common language, but that just work for, for themselves. And it's difficult to elaborate a kind of common, common terms for for, for the same objects. And finally, um, style recommendation algorithms. So the companies who work in that field are Fashion Metric, True and Call, Style Seek, Style DNA. All of them, they try again to describe the style in a number of categories and help to uh, e-commerce companies to recommend garments to consumers based on number of, of different aspects. Now I will pass the microphone to Gina who is uh, a director of fashion merchandising in School of Fashion. Hello. Hi. I try to make it quick, but I am always very passionate about talking about fashion to non-fashion people. So if I get long and long and long, just cut me off. Really, this is one of the best topics. You know, I'm really passionate about fashion industry. And also, I'm really, really interested in technology myself. So this is one of my favorite topic ever. I, I, I can, if I can talk to non-fashion industry people about fashion that I can talk about the whole day. So <laughs> please cut me off, feel free to. So this is the first thing. Well, just let me introduce myself. I'm a director of merchandising uh, at Academy of Art University, and I also manage fashion marketing and product development. And my background, I, my professional career in fashion studied as a design. I was designing for women's wear, and I was a buyer for Escada, uh, one of my fellow <laughs> German company. So I did buying, and also I worked for Cartier, a French uh, jewelry company uh, for retail and marketing. That was my industry background. And then I started teaching. And when I came to the uh, academic side of the industry, and I also worked with a lot of small startups. So 2014, I was a co-founder of one of the IoT, little IoT, um, the beauty-related company I co-founded, Way Wearable, uh, based in Seoul, Korea. So I'm really interested in the technology side of the fashion and the opportunity that technology brings to the fashion industry is really, really humongous. So this is one of the things that when you think about fashion, how glamorous, right? It's beautiful and everybody is so fancy, you know, everything is pretty. These are the people that you assume that most of the fashion people are. Am I correct? No? <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> because this is not the real fashion. I mean, this is a real fashion, but this is the surface of the fashion industry. You know, this fancy and glamorous side of the fashion is actually, this is what's behind. You know, fashion industry that I'm talking about is this business side of the fashion. And if you combine fashion and textile all together, it's over $3 trillion business in the world. So it's really, really huge. If we are talking about the magazine business, you know, it's gonna be a, like very fraction of, very little part of fashion industry. But if we are talking about manufacturing, textile and apparel industry, this is over $3 trillion. So that's why I'm really excited because I wanna talk about how hardworking industry fashion is, unlike many people think, oh yeah, fashion people are just, you know, they just go shop. No, that's not what we do. <laughs> So just briefly, I think that what, 
Elena introduced the challenges and opportunities in fashion, but I think it would be helpful for you to understand um, what we do in fashion industry. You know, of course, because fashion is a very fragmented industry, my experience is very limited. My, in, my, in this, my experience is not from Zara. Uh, I am very focused on, you know, women's wear, contemporary women's wear, luxury businesses. So it's very different from gap businesses or target businesses. So what I'm sharing is based on my experience, but I think it's very traditional fashion businesses that you can understand a little bit about how we do things in fashion. So first of all, I tried to simplify. This is one of the projects I did when I was in the um, other institution. We did a collaboration project with the Microsoft Studio based in, um, in Portland. And then they were trying to understand how fashion industry works so that this technology, I mean, there's a lot of technology that is developed, how those can be used in any part of the fashion industry. Because non-fashion people, you know, fashion is like the surface, you know, what you see is what you understand as fashion. So the first thing I did is trying to simplify how fashion value chain works so that you can understand, you can actually explore more opportunity than you see on the surface. So the first part is what Elena mentioned is the forecasting. Forecasting takes a lot of time. I will talk about a little bit later, but the forecasting based on this direction, designers, product development, each retailers are developing their product. And then, of course, designing is not the way um, the product is available, right? Once the designing and the product development is done, it has to be produced all over the world to be able to be delivered to the store where actually customers can buy. So it's really complicated global process if you're looking at the fashion as a business. So I'm assuming a lot of you are wearing a denim today, so I'm sure that everybody has a pair of denim, right? No? <laughs> yes, right. So how difficult it is to make a denim, you think? If it, anybody went to the Forever 21 in your life? Yes. Do you know how much they charge for a pair of denim? They have a special price, $9.99. $9, dollars denim, right? For me, it's a magic. Because if you really think about how the denim is made, it starts from the cotton field, right? Because somebody has to make a fabric. Denim is made out of cotton. So if you really think about the scope of the businesses and it has to be delivered, somehow it is processed and everything is delivered to the textile mills, so they have to make a fabric, and then it's gonna be used by the designers and product developers, you know, fashion companies. They create all these fancy designs, and then eventually it has to be produced, right? And then it's gonna be go to the stores and available for us. And then you see on the street, people are wearing all this denim. So the simple $10 denim, I mean, I'm trying to make a very extreme case of the denim, but you know, the one pair of denim actually go through a lot of complicated process to be available for us. So that's how the fashion industry, what we see from the surface, is very a fraction of what we do. We love data. As a buyer, when I was working, that's what, we, what I did all day long. I tried to analyze what's been sold, you know, what is selling well, what is going to be sell, selling well, why this is selling well. This is what we do every day. We love data, right? And then because, first of all, the first thing I did every morning was tracking the sales. I collect all the sales data from all different locations and I try to figure out what's selling well because I have to buy more or I have to buy less. You know, I, all this sales data is really, really important. What we did is very traditional way of tracking numbers. We didn't have the technology that you are doing. <laughs> so we're literally doing those based sales programs. You know, we, we still use those until mid 2000. I'm sure they still use them. But we used for the sales, uh, sales tracking, inventory management, and also production. Where on this cycle of the production, where are those materials? Where are we with the productions? And this is, help us, this is helping us to actually plan our next seasons. This is one of the screen I used. I mean, not exactly like this because it's kind of, you know. But this is a screen, the those space screen I used tracking all the sales data, all the inventories. I'm sure many companies are using this still. And then 
the technology developed, some of the current technology used in the fashion industry is visualizing not just visual search, but actually visualizing the look, how it is going to be produced without actually making the samples. Sampling process requires a lot of labor, a lot of time, a lot of material, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of things. But a lot, many companies are actually successfully actually uh, doing the visualization of the looks even we, before we make the samples using those patterns. You know, it's more like a blueprint, right, of the pieces of different garments and then put together depending on the fabric, what type of material is going to be used. They can actually visualize even before we make the products. As Alina mentioned, Edited is one of those great tools that you can track what's current and then what is coming up and down. You know, it's more like a stock tracking, right? So those are the things that we are using. This is really necessary for any fashion companies. If you look at, at the case of Zara, you know, Zara has over 2,000 stores, right? And then in 88 different markets, 27 different languages, online. So if you think about the scope of the fashion businesses, data is really, really critical. That's why we love data. Uh, we just don't have the sophisticated data set that you guys are developing. But that's why how important the data is for fashion businesses. I mean, if you think about the whole the logistics of the product that fashion companies dealing with every day, is the amount of the product that we deal with going so many different locations. You know, this, there are a lot of opportunity this science and technology can solve the problem for us. Lianfang is one of the um, global, uh, the biggest outsourcing, the sourcing company. So they produce from all over the world. So not just selling thousands and thousands of different locations, but producing this many different locations. Data in production stage is also very, very important for fashion companies. So what are the challenges? The reality of the fashion is, I try to summarize based on our current practices, not you know, just looking at the science or technological view, but as a fashion industry person, time and complex supply chain, you know, fashion is fancy, but it's one of the very traditionally run business still, because we have to deal with the lamb in Australia to make the wool fabric, and then we have to deal with the cotton from the field. So it's very, uh, human labor driven and then very traditionally run, run businesses. Standardization is another issue. And unexpected events like any other industry, but we have a lot more interesting unexpected events in fashion and the human factors. So those cycles, if you think about it, you know, from trend forecasting, yesterday I was pulling this data from one of our subscriptions about the trend forecasting. We are looking at spring, summer 2018. So the fashion industry people are already working on 2018 spring, summer. So right now we are 2016, August. So predicting the, that much of further in event is not just predicting it, but until when we actually are at 2018, there's a lot of time gap. So anything can happen because our timeline for this kind of product development is so long compared to any other industry. Another real, the real problem is one simple garments like this, there are so many components coming from so many different places. Not everything is gonna be made and then supplied in one place. All little parts are coming from all over the place, depending on where they're good at it. And then once we collect all these materials from five, six different places, just making a pair of denim we go through multiple countries just to cut, just to saw, just to assemble. So if you think about the traditional fashion supply chain, there are definitely a challenges to be able to automate the process. This is what customers see, white free neck t-shirts, right? And then when they go online, all right, this is what I see as a consumer. Buyers and then fashion producers, this is what we see. First of all, one style, one V-neck t-shirt, when it comes to us, we have 12 different colors. Price also different, it's the same style, but depending on the color, we have a different price because something sells well, something doesn't sell well. 
And we have regular fit and tall fit. And then each category, we have how many different sizes. So all of a sudden, one V-neck t-shirt became 100 different styles. So that's one of the reality that we face in the fashion industry because that's why it's, it's really difficult to standardize any of those processes. No wonder when you thought about, have you ever had experience, oh, I, I wear large, but some brands, that fits. But when you go to other brands, large doesn't fit. Have you ever wondered? Yeah? That's how much the fashion industry is not standardized because we target very specific group of people. When you're talking about large for 18-year-old boy versus 45-year-old man, it's very different large size, right? So there is very challenges of the sizing. There is very lack of standardization because of many different reasons. Also, there are different styles of denim. So no wonder there is very difficult uh, standardization issues. Everybody knows Kanye West, right? <laughs> Celebrity. So why all of a sudden he decided to collaborate with Adidas? I'm not talking about natural disaster which affect global economy. Yes, that affects global fashion industry, definitely. But I'm talking about more interesting events that we see every day in fashion. He decided to collaborate with Adidas. All of a sudden, sneaker, which we don't pay over $200 or $300 in general, became $3,000. And the people are crazy for it. If you go to eBay right now, this is the price you have to pay. It used to be in retail $350. How do we, how do we predict this kind of unexpected event? Because fashion, you know, we never know what. I'm not political here, so <laughs> when, uh, so when she had the speech, probably everybody talked about how great she, speaker she was. You know, she was really great, or something was not great. But we see fashion people. We saw her nail polish. <laughs> Next day, this is the article that we saw. I found out where, what color that nail polish is. And all of a sudden, this blue-gray nail polish sold out. Can machine predict this kind of event? We don't even predict this kind of thing. I mean, who would have even, even imagined when she had the, this was a time, New York Times, you know, it was her back, you know, the photo from her back. She had this way, and then somebody saw this color on her nail. Yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> See, oh, thank you very much for coming because I can talk about this all day long. So, so the last one is a human factor. You know, even every individual, we have a different motivations of buying things. And another, the bottom line is, you know the Mean Girl movie, right? They want to be different, right? They definitely stand out from any other crowds. But if you're looking at them, among them, they are similar. So the human, most of the, our customers, they want to be different, but at the same time, they want to be the same. So if we predict, and another thing, this is one of the popular Gucci collection last year, and then you probably wonder why this guy is wearing this flower thingy on the neck, right? How can you predict men wearing this kind of dressy blouses? Because Gucci showed this is really popular. This is going to be really popular. So those kind of predictions and about the human factors are really, really making it difficult for fashion industry to adopt the, the, the technology in any, any, any given point. Because it can change. And then if we follow the direction of these numbers and trends that we see from the data, this is how we all look like. Eventually, because if I buy exactly the same thing based on my previous season, I will buy the same thing which sold the most, right? And if I continue to buy more same styles, at the end of the day, we will wear the same thing because that's what's, what's selling the most. So the fashion industry faces a lot of different challenges. We have to sell well, but at the same time, we have to make it different and fresh all the time. Otherwise, we will all look like wearing the uniform, right? So, did I make the time? Yes, yes. If you have any questions you know, for Elena and myself, I think we have 
probably one minute. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have, this is more just uh, an industry question. How do the, um, you know, the, the sort of designers more on the creative end um, actually make a business out of it? Uh, are, are people buying these things for astronomical yes. prices? Yes. So okay. can I, do you guys hear the question? Do you want me to, to repeat it? The question was how the creative designers actually make a business. Well, uh, some difficultly, but at the end of the day, uh, those with really um, outstanding designs, they do have audience for that. These are smaller groups, niche, you know, consumers who do buy those garments. So an example, I've been working in St. Petersburg, Russia, for a designer, amazing designer, uh, doing now mainly couture pieces. So those are dresses that, I don't know, probably range from 2000 to $10,000. But these are one of the kind dresses that, that are bought by celebrities. Her company does really great and and, and, and survives within, I mean, 20, 20 years. So, uh, yeah, well, for some of them it's really difficult because fast fashion companies, they have um, more resources sometimes and, uh, and they have larger audience of consumers. But uh, for creative designers, it's, it's a choice. And again, many of them, they, they they don't break even, they do really nice business, but they, the market for it, it's really much smaller than for larger productions. Do you want to answer on your end? No, I think just, yeah. Um, regarding your prediction problem, well, in a way you have, uh, you could also say, if we were able to influence the trend enough, we wouldn't have to predict anymore. Mm -hmm. So how much effort are you actually shifting from prediction to influencing? I think you know the challenge with the prediction and influencing because right now the celebrity is really a big influence, right? We're trying to understand why they're influencing, but we don't know because all of a sudden Kardashians, for example, Kim Kardashian, right? I mean, whether you know my personal opinion aside, she's really influencing the whole fashion industry, and we have to understand those influences. Uh, but I think honestly. Fashion is such a complicated uh, process and a very human-driven business is still. So the, the influencing, we are, you're, we are still catching up in the industry. We were not, it was much easier like 10 years ago. We, do, we need to contact the influencers such as the, um, the editors of Vogue or you know, major media. And then that was much, much easier. But right now it's really difficult. There is uh, Instagrammers you know, who, doesn't really do anything but Instagramming and then doing the Instagram tours. You know, that's what they do. They have a tours. Uh, those are, um, what they do is they take their own photos and then there are millions of followers. Then they do the tour and meet with the fans. They never worked in the industry. They're like t not even 20 years old. And the fashion industry is trying to tap into these people because they have influence. But do we create influences? It's very, I think we are behind, honestly. Um, my question is, if we don't want to predict the fashion trend in-house, if we want to buy from some company, other than edited, which everyone uses, which are your recommendations? And my second question is, if we don't want to make um, recommendation algorithm in-house and we want to by the recommendation service from some other company, which are your recommendations? Thank you. So, yeah, so, so your prediction, uh, let me, <laughs> sorry. So when you're, when you're looking at the uh, forecasting, right? In fashion, we are using different type of forecasting. We do sales forecasting, which is more buying and merchandising side. What we were showing as a visual is more creative direction forecasting, like colors and uh, styles and forms and things like that. So in term, when, when you're saying the forecasting, are you talking about a specific like sales forecast or? Oh yeah, there are multiple companies actually similar to WGSN that I show, you know, 2018 spring and summer. There are multiple companies actually providing these specific forecasting services. They don't just uh, predict 
V-neck versus round neck, what they're doing is at how customer moves. So for example, they want more peaceful world because of their, there are so many technologies of, you know, out there, so they want to be more nomad type of thing. So from lifestyle to colors, to materials, to specific silhouette, like this type of pants or maybe tight pants, you know, there's much more specific style directions are provided by multiple companies such as WGSN, um, and also there's Peckler, which is based in France. And also there are small companies uh, actually focused more on specific areas of those trend forecasting in fashion. So if you do search, um, Yeah, I think Elena can answer a little bit more about this. Uh, I wanted also to uh, refer to another company based in Paris as well. It's called Trend Union. Trend. That's the one which was recommended by our um, instructor on uh, fashion forecasting, actually. Trend Union. They are based in Paris. They are very proprietary on the methodology they use. So it's both quantifying, but it's also a lot of you know, old school analysis. And they they have an online platform which is called Trend Tablet. You can try those. And another company that our for, uh, forecasting instructor recommended was uh, aliceandglobal.net. So you can check that one as well. And as far as the style predictions that we you are actually looking at, you know, there is a, um, what we see is there's a trend in fashion industry, the pendulum effect. So basically, uh, if you're looking at the historical uh, data or historical visuals of the styles, you can find those trends. So basically, uh, the wide bottom, wide pants was popular, and then it became like, you know, tight, you know, more tight pants, and it became more wider. There's different type of trend that you can find over the years with the historical data. So you know, those predictions could could kind of give you the direction if you're doing in-house. That could be definitely helpful if you're looking at the street. Uh, and then what customers are wearing at any given time. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs>